so glad you could join us for today's webinar, The Year Ahead in Global Transportation and U.S. Import Compliance. This event was organized by the United States Fashion Industry Association, representing brands, retailers, importers, and wholesalers based in the U.S. and doing business globally, as well as our friends at Third Wave. My name is Shannon Brady. I'm the Communications Director at USFIA. I'll be your moderator today. Um, and if we could quickly go to the next slide, I'll, I have a few technical notes before we begin today. The first is that questions can be submitted at any time during the live program. Simply click on the question header on your webinar control panel, type your text into the box, and hit send. We'll address as many questions as possible at the end of the program. If for some reason we experience a technical difficulty and lose audio, please refer to the chat box for further instructions. A quick reminder that all registered participants will receive an email later today with a copy of the slide deck and a recording of today's session. So now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenter for the day, Dan Gardner from Third Wave. Dan is a true thought leader in the area of international trade, compliance, and logistics. Dan has both hands-on experience as a VP of logistics for a mid-sized importer and as a senior executive with sev several large 3PLs. In addition to his professional experience, Dan is a professor of supply chain management. So welcome, Dan. We're so glad you could join us today. Um, and now I'll hand the floor over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Shannon, and, and thank you to everyone for for tuning in. I, I was telling Shannon when we had a, a little warm up prior to 11 a.m. West Coast where I am that uh, we as Third Wave are really flattered to, to be invited here today. Uh, this this invitation started as a blog post of uh, of the same title as you see here in this slide: Carrier Shippers and Customs. Oh my, the year ahead in global transportation and trade compliance, and and we were invited to participate based on that. So just really happy to be here, uh, flattered, and we'll jump into the presentation in just, uh, in just a moment. Um, I will say, if you look at the bottom of this slide, that the original broadcast, we, we did this as a webinar as well, uh, going back on January 14th, when the, when the year was truly new. It's, it's hard to believe we're two months past that. But I wanted to point out before we start that much, if not all, of the, the prediction component of the of the webinar, I, I left the same because I think it's important to, to be able to compare what what we said we thought was going to to happen in in transportation and in trade compliance, et cetera, and how the year is folding out. And I'm happy to report that uh, there might have been a thing or two that we missed. Uh, you know, it's hard to predict the future, but much of what we said has has held to be true. Um, there's some additional information, and I will point that out, that's new that we put in, uh, new things that, that we have learned and we think people should pay attention to. But th there's, there was a bit of history associated with this and, and certainly wanted to be, wanted to share that with you. Now, Shannon already went through my, my background and such, so we won't read through this. Uh, I, I come from a freight forwarding, what we used to call freight forwarding and customs brokerage background. Um, I am a licensed customs broker and very much involved, obviously, in the, in the software, the digitization of global supply chains. So for today's agenda, let's, let's get down to business here. And as Shannon also said, you can type in your questions at any time. Uh, we will we'll bulk them up till we'll answer them at the end. And if we run over time, I'm, I'm happy to stick around. Certainly don't want to impose on on your valuable time, but if there are questions that for any reason we don't get to, uh, we'll certainly come back and answer them and share them directly. But agenda, quick three slides on third wave and who we are as global trade management software providers. And then bearing in mind that the information here was first presented in January of this year, an economic outlook for 2021, setting the stage for trade, trade volumes, third bullet point, predictions and observations on the Trans-Pacific eastbound trade. Obviously, that Asia to, to the United States, be it West Coast or Gulf uh, East Coast through the Panama Canal. And then we'll get into 2021 developments and predictions for trade compliance and trade policy. In 2021, pretty interesting section there. I think, think you'll like that. 
And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the trade technology landscape. If there's anything that, that, that came to the forefront, apart from supply chain congestion and disruption and such, is this whole theme of supply chain resiliency. I think if, if I hear the word resiliency one more time, I think I'm going to scream. But it gets used so much because it's so true. How, how can we make supply chains more resilient? And in that context, what we'll use, we'll talk about technology to enable supply chains even further. So a couple of quick slides, whoops, on third wave. We are a global trade management software platform. Web native, web native, AWS housed, based on experience that has been accumulated as third wave as a company. If we jump ahead on our bullets on the right here, third wave headquartered in Toronto, offices here in Los Angeles, where I am, has been in business for 30 years, uh, developing trade management software solutions. All web native today, both import and export oriented, but developing over the last five years, as we see in our bullet points here, the next generation of supply chain technology. And we're talking about disability tools, management tools, definitely compliance tools, starting with product master data, things of this nature. But over the years, because we have been in business for, for many years, you'll note in our second bullet here, over $100 billion in supply chain business. That's the value of merchandise moved. We are 15 employees, not a huge organization, but as I like to say as a, as a boxing fan and an MMA fan, pound for pound, we can, we can compete with, with anybody. We're thinking through big problems, and there's lots of them out there today. And as I mentioned, headquartered in Toronto, regional office here in Los Angeles. But really, as a value prop, our mission is to enable companies, shippers, beneficial cargo owners, to use a synonymous term, end-to-end -end visibility, but also the control, <clears throat> excuse me, that companies need, BCOs, beneficial cargo owners need, from a user-centric perspective of all activities throughout a supply chain. Bearing in mind that we have import and export solutions, but given the nature of our group today, we'll talk in more import-centric terms. So essentially, everything that goes on in a web native environment from the time you issue a purchase order on an overseas vendor, be they in Asia, Eastern Europe, Central America, doesn't matter, until receipt at the warehouse. And again, that's visibility, control, management tools, et cetera. This is the last slide before we jump into our presentation. We do take an integrated approach of all these solutions, but they're modular in nature, starting with product master data, product description, your item numbers, country of origin, HTS codes, things of, of that nature. But delivering products that are totally modular, but like Lego, they snap together to provide a fully integrated solution. I really like that anecdote. But to run through this quickly, and we'll get into the presentation right now, global trade management, customs management, import, export, control, and execution, that international transportation piece, which incorporates end-to-end -end visibility as you transition, from a PO environment, purchasing environment, into transportation, into a customs environment, and even out into a domestic delivery environment. I alluded to master data management, big time players can do the drawback. Our solutions are, are so robust that we actually enable companies to do self-filing and at the very least broker entry audits and a landed cost calculator. So that's who we are. And now we're going to move into the presentation. As I said, you can type in your questions at any time. We will answer them at the, at the bottom of the presentation. All right. So this presentation started back on Jan 14th with economic outlook for 20, 2021, setting the stage for trade volumes. And I think the first bullet point uh, stands true. We still don't know what business and consumer demand will look like throughout 2021, but I think we're getting a better picture. And, and demand, certainly from a societal perspective, consumption of merchandise, which is predominantly import-driven in the United States, that, that demand remains strong. In fact, today I was I, I checking my business feeds, the stock market broke another, I think it was the Dow went past 33,000 or something crazy, something crazy like that. So I, I think the, the optimism is there. I'm wondering if the accompanying disposable income is going to be there, and we'll talk more about that in just one second. Uh, the stimulus package will help. 
for a while. And again, we made this statement two months ago. So obviously, the stimulus package just came through. People are starting to receive checks. What they do with those funds as it relates to consumption, buying merchant, but buying goods, be they of domestic or international origin, remains to, to be seen. But I, I still believe, and this has been updated as well, the third bullet, the consumer confidence will continue to be a function in part of how vaccination numbers unfold. And it seems, listening to the news and such, that vaccinations are up. I'm, I'm happy to report, actually, that I got my first shot, uh, Moderna, here in Southern California, just last week. You might be saying, well, you don't look like you're over 65. At least I hope I don't look like I'm over 65. How did you pull that off? Well, I'm, I'm on the faculty at Cal State Long Beach as an adjunct professor and considered an essential worker. So Cal State Long Beach sent out an email a week or two back saying, if you, if you can find your Cal State Long Beach lecturer ID, you can go get a, a vaccine. So I did that, and I'm, I'm getting the other one in a couple weeks. But consumer, this how vaccine numbers are folding out, you're hearing a couple million a day. We're, we're making good progress. So I, I think from a psychological perspective, and that's really important as part of consumer confidence, that it just seems, at least here in Southern Southern California, where I am, that, that the optimism is there. The belief that we've turned a corner a little bit is still there. Um, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, or as I heard someone on the news say, we don't want to spike the football on the five-yard line. But I think that consumer confidence in there is there. But the question becomes, Disposable income, which is defined as the money you have to spend on discretionary items after you pay. Obviously, you get to take home pay, but you pay your rent, your mortgage, groceries, things of this nature. What's left over to go online and buy myself a pair of shoes or go to the sporting goods store and, and buy myself a new baseball glove or whatever your interest happens to be? People still have to get back to work. So I, I think the monetary fact of the matter is that disposable income will be down in 2021 which will put pressure on discretionary spending. Uh, it, it hasn't slowed down in terms of spending and demand, but that, as we'll discuss in a moment, the demand for products and the increase we saw throughout the last year what was really a function of people weren't able to spend money on going out to eat or going to the movies or going on vacation or taking that cruise. So if they have a couple extra bucks laying around, you, you know, the old saying goes, when the going gets tough, the tough goes shopping. You all know this, given the industry that you're in. That, that is precisely what happened. I, I have to wonder if there's going to be any retail fatigue moving forward. That there's just so many new, 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 grill, new gas grills you can buy. There's just so many new pairs, well, maybe not pairs you can buy, but you, you know what I mean. Okay, let's move on. More, more geographically centric as it's related to supply chain and logistics. Let's talk about the Trans-Pacific Eastbound, the TPEB, that Asia to U.S., be it West Coast, be it Gulf, be it East Coast via the Panama Canal. Two months ago, we said, and this proved to be true, import volumes will remain brisk through CNY, the Lunar New Year, which has just been been wrapping up and it's obviously continuing forward. In fact, I'm interested in seeing the surge that comes out of post CNY, let, let's say using a two week window for transportation lead time from Yantian to Long Beach being about 15, 15 days. What's the surge going to look like in container traffic coming into, coming into the country, bearing in mind that there were stories coming out of South China and other countries that, that celebrate the Lunar New Year that even things you might not even think about, drivers to do drayage at origin, there was a paucity of drivers because lots of people go back to their ancestral homes, their hometowns. So I think there's going to be a, a backlog. Well, no, I don't think. I know there's, there's a backlog at, or, backlog at origin as well. So you might see a, a surge. Backlogs and congestion, second bullet point here, at major U.S. sports will take at least three months to clear out. We said that two months ago. That will remain true. Uh, in, in fact, this, this last weekend, and I think it's getting a little better. Uh, I live here in Southern Cal, uh, just one town over from the L.A. Long Beach Port Complex, and, and actually went down to the lookout point uh, where you can look from San Pedro, if you're familiar with the geography of, of L.A. Long Beach Port Complex. And the congestion is still there, but down from a high of 39, 40 ships at anchor, not at birth, at anchor, to 
around 20 this week. So that that is improving, but it's just still a lot. And if you look back historically, when the when we had some labor disputes in LA Long Beach and, and other events, financial crisis, etc., it took two to three months to clear out congestion. That's that's going to remain true. But it also it's not just a and you know this. This isn't just a terminal thing, an ocean terminal or a container yard or a port thing. That congestion finds its way into rail ramps, finds its way into truck lanes, etc. And when you throw in the weather that has transpired since January 14th, when we first did this broadcast, things things have gotten pretty pretty crazy. Uh, we've had winter weather that, that slowed down intermodal rail. Uh, we've had really bad weather. Hope everyone's okay. Uh, the tornadoes and such in Alabama, Georgia, et cetera. We had the, the big Texas issue. All of that coming together, it's going to take at least three months to, to clear out the congestion at major U.S. ports. As a part of that whole story, third bullet point, and you, you probably heard this, but pre- predominantly on the import side, you, you're not suffering as much as exporters, but export, export containers, loads that are going out of the country in the U.S. will remain scarce for at least that long. And we'll talk about this in an upcoming slide and how transload as an import, import model has become more popular because ocean carriers and NGOs as well they like to terminate bills of lading at the, at the port of discharge. So that creates a scarcity of containers inland in the United States to begin with. And in speaking with exporters and here in Southern California, where, where there's a huge export community just around agricultural products, I'm talking almonds and walnuts and pistachios and such, they've suffered a great deal. And they're on the coast. So imagine how hard it is to get a container in the interior of the United States. <clears throat> Last bullet here, the FMC, and they still won't, by the way, won't take action on demurrage and or detention. Um, it is, I, this, is a personal, this is my professional opinion uh, of this matter, that the FMC won't take action on demurrage and or detention. And I'm talking about justifiably BCOs, like many of you online here today, who are, are upset about being charged demurrage in scenarios that are completely out of your control, the murage being per diem charges for containers not taken off a terminal in a timely fashion. So you look at L.A. Long Beach that's having all kinds of congestion issues. Even when a ship gets a berth, that you get, let's say, four days free time on the terminal, and it takes four or five days to offload the ship, the container becomes available, and then there's so much congestion, you, you get a response back from your drayage or your people or your customs broker using an acronym that's become very unpopular, UTL, unable to locate, and all of a sudden it's seven days, and then you can't even get an appointment. None of this being your fault. You're good to go. Your container's cleared. Well, what, why should you be charged for four days to marriage for something that you have nothing to do with? Um, the, the question is, or I should say the response is you shouldn't have to, but that doesn't mean it's going to change any. And the FMC not only will they not do anything, I don't think they can. And, and, and by the time they could, the problem will be over. So that's that. And, and the, the same principle applies to detention. You, you want to return an empty container, but again, there's 13 container terminals. I don't want to pick on LA Long Beach, but I live right next door to it, so I have some experience with that. But if you, if you get 10 days free time on a container and you want to – bring a container back within the time period allotted, but you can't get an appointment. You get an appointment, but your drainage person gets turned away. It's not fair. But <laughs> who said there was ever anything fair about international trade? Uh, we can't operate on that assumption. So that, that's not going to change anything. Okay. Let's talk some more about this trans-Pacific eastbound. Here's the thing about the pandemic as it relates to the ocean carriers. And this is not an exaggeration. I'm I'm sure you'll agree after a year has gone by. The ocean carriers, after years of boom and bust periods, mostly bust in terms of their losses, went through an existential crisis, a near-death experience. And that is not an exaggeration. The pandemic almost put them out of business. But what they did was finally get together within their legal rights to manipulate supply, i.e. blank sailing 
support their pricing. And if you look historically at attempts for things like GRIs, not so much blank sailings, but general rate increases, peak season surcharges, and in the in the post conference era, the post Ocean Shipping Reform Act era, for any carrier who gave in and and took up took out a GRI or, or decided not to put a peak season surcharge, everyone else followed. That was just the way it is. And it was a buyer's market. We all know this, with bigger ships coming in, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this, ex- this existential crisis ca- caused the carriers to get together and say, hey, w- if we don't manipulate supply, blank sailings, we're going out of business, period. And that's the way it's been, and that's the way it will con- continue to be, I think, even in a post-pandemic era, because they learned, the carriers learned, justifiably and understandably from their perspective, that this is what they need to do. Second bullet, when it comes to full container load pricing, we won't talk, talk too much about LCL here today, but uncertainty favors the carriers and the NVOCCs. And this is as much a psychological issue as it is a, a tactical or operational issue. Do you really want to be that VP of, of logistics for an importer or an exporter for that matter who's going to hold out during contract season till the last possible moment and then find yourself with no capacity? We saw this when when the Section 301, i.e. Trump tariffs, came in, when rates were going up anyway, people start to get in panic mode. And and buy early and buy often becomes the credo. So I think it doesn't mean you as BCOs on on the line today can't do a good job of negotiating. It just means that uncertainty favors the CARES and the NGOCCs, and you you don't want to be last man, last woman, or last BCO standing trying to hold out for better rates, and then there's no capacity. So people are, are getting their pricing squared away even sooner. And that's the point we make in bullet point number three here. BCOs will negotiate rates sooner rather than later. Fourth point, contract rates, well, this, this isn't exactly a prescient statement. Contract rates will be higher than 2020. You're probably saying to yourself, no kidding but probably substantially higher. I was looking at the Drury Index this morning, bearing in mind that this is a global index. It's not a Trans-Pacific Eastbound Index, but you could say the same about the Shanghai Index, actually. As of today, this morning, I looked at it about an hour ago, uh, $5,000 for an FEU, bearing in mind that that's a global index. So I worked as a BCO going back as recently as three, four years ago, importer. Uh, and those are the days of, of 1500 bucks for a 40-footer from Yantian to Long Beach are long over, and it's not likely that they're going to return. Now, this last bullet here, this, this is one of the ones, the prediction that I made, and I'm thinking, because we have the benefit of two, two months' time, I said part rates will come down by June. Um, not very likely. It's almost April. I mean, they could. But now, you, now you're talking, get, starting to get into early peak, if you will, where companies are preparing for back to school holidays, et cetera. So the rush continues past CNY. There's no relief in sight. So that, that last bullet, I, I have to admit, probably inaccurate. But we'll have to wait and see because in the end, nobody can predict the future. Moving on, <clears throat> just checking my, my watch here. I mentioned this briefly a moment ago in the context of a paucity of export containers in the central part of the United States. So let's continue this conversation, albeit from an import perspective. Carriers, the ocean carriers, are going to push for termination of bills of lading at the port of discharge. It's a, it's a container repositioning thing. If you can terminate a container in Wilmington, California, five miles from the port, it's a lot easier for the steamship line to get those containers, turn them around, get them back to Asia, than if they were in Fort Worth, Texas, or Topeka, and, <clears throat> excuse me. So given the above, and we've talked a lot about this as the third wave, Transload will grow in popularity at U.S. ports. If you're not familiar with Transload, and I assume many, if not most of you are, that's when full containers come in for port of discharge, the contents of which are stripped. This photo that you see on the right here, that's an actual Transload facility in Wilmington, Carson, sorry, California. The contents of those containers the destination of the contents of those containers have been predetermined, communicated to a transload operator, which is typically a third-party logistics company, and then on-forwarded either by rail or truck to multiple destinations. That's what we mean by transload. That 
will grow in popularity because these containers or these transload facilities ideally are in close proximity to port operations. And it could be Charleston, it could be Seattle, it could be Oakland. It's not just LA, Long Beach. So it's beneficial to the BCO to use transload because they can make determinations on where to send merchandise based on actual demand signals for online purchases, retail as it comes back, et cetera. And the carriers love it because the container, this transload facility, I took this picture. This is a couple of years old. You can see the cranes at the ports of LA Long Beach from the yard of this facility. So obviously getting the empty back is, is much better for the carriers. Third bullet, domestic truck rates will come down, but not as much as ocean FTL prices. We'll see how that pans out. The, the wild card here for, for both domestic transportation and ocean transportation is uh, fuel, diesel and bunker, respectively. And I, I think we're, we're so distracted by high ocean base rates that we need to keep our eye on the ball on, on FSC as well, fuel surcharge. So I'm sure you are as BCOs, but pay attention to those as you negotiate as well. And intermodal will behave similarly to FTL trucking. Uh, as a brief aside, apart from some of the rail carriers, and we won't single them out, it's not hard to figure out, there's two that go east to west in the U.S., are charging low-volume surcharges, low-volume shippers. I saw this, public information, $250 a load additional surcharge. And, of course, the, the rail has been slowed down by weather also, so there's a cost and a timing component associated with that story. Okay, so that's it at least for now, on the Trans-Pacific East file, let's transition into the trade compliance and trade policy observations and predictions, as we see in the title of our slide here. Uh, this, this one's out of date. Uh, I'm one of these licensed customs brokers. I literally, I have at least once a year. It's gotten better over the years. I got my broker's license in 1989 when I was 10 years old. I was a compliance prodigy, I used to say. Uh, obviously, I'm joking, but I did get my license in 89. And invariably, to this day, I still have the, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a nightmare, but the bad dream that I forgot to submit my triennial, triennial report and my license expired. So I pay a lot of attention to this stuff. So here, here's the deal. If you, if you are a broker, a licensed, individual licensed customs broker, and you didn't file, you're a little late. Uh, I luckily got mine in, and everything was, everything was good. But also, and this is important, all joking aside, Second bullet, as an individual holder of a customs broker's license, get ready for continuing ed requirements. You know, the thing about being a licensed customs broker, every three years um, you have to pay $100 and you can't have become a felon. That's a pretty low threshold when you think about it to keep as a role as important as a licensed customs broker. Continuing ed is coming, and I think personally, and, and I'm a big advocate of education. Again, I've been an adjunct professor my entire career, I think it's necessary, and, and I think it should be this way. But if you want to read about it, if this is coming as news, on a, in the October 28th, 2020 Federal Register, there was an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, and that rulemaking includes 40 hours of continuing ed over a three-year period for, for licensed customs brokers, and that is very likely to take place. Okay, so here's a couple of predictions here that like some of the other ones I made, or I should say unlike some of the other ones I've made, actually stand true, and I, and I will stand by this moving forward. And this is important for, for wearing apparel fashion people especially. The Section 301 temp, Trump tariffs will remain in, play, in place throughout 20, 2021. Why, why, why did I say that, and why do I continue to say that? Well, reason number one is the U.S. Treasury needs the money. Simple as that. We, we have a little bit of a deficit, deficit issue going on, not only a trade deficit, but a budgetary deficit. And, and only, even though it's only $70 billion a year, only, if you can imagine that, $70 billion a year in customs duties that are, that are collected, we need the money, and it's not going to go away. Reason number two, and unfortunately this is more political than anything, but if you think about it, regardless of what your political orientation might be, Removing the Trump tariffs would be bad optics for the new administration, who's now been in office for you know, a good couple months now. And, and you see this parenthetically, and I didn't make up this term. It's, you can see it in the news anywhere. Political opponents would label Beijing Biden as a China 
sympathizer. And that's just bad optics. It's a political motivation. But the fact that we don't have any money and there's why why commit an unforced political era error, I should say, Trump tariffs aren't going anywhere. With that said, let's talk a little bit about type eighty six customs entries or what what are also not necessarily synonymously referred to as section three twenty one shipments. If you're not familiar with this term, a type eight, a section three twenty one shipment are goods that are based mainly, especially in the fashion industry, in a B2C or a, now what's being referred to as direct-to-consumer, where goods that if I go online and I buy myself a new a new baseball glove and it's coming directly from a vendor in Taiwan as opposed to being imported into the United States in bulk with the 10,000 other baseball gloves, duties paid, et cetera, companies can ship under a Section 321 shipment directly from the factory or the vendor overseas and as long as that shipment is $800 or less than $800 in value, what's called the de minimis rule, the customs clearance procedure to me as the buyer, and the need to, that becomes a lot easier, and the customs duties are, are waived. But there's some goings on here. <laughs> the biggest going on is that when this rule went into place, type, type 86 goes back to, 2018, I don't know that CBP or the federal government and certainly didn't anticipate the pandemic and a spike in, in direct shipments from, from overseas, but didn't, didn't either anticipate just the growth, the growth in international B2C, especially as it relates to stuff coming out of China for those Section 301 tariffs. CBP is losing money. So what, what happens here? There might be a reversal or change to the 800 de minimis rule coming forward. And it, it used to be 200 going back some couple of years back. It was raised to 800 to accommodate a growth in international business to consumer, direct to consumer trade. But don't be surprised if it goes back down. And that means a lot to the fashion industry because it's not only a timing issue, a lead time issue from the time I go on and buy my new baseball glove until I get it but also the cost. So we really need to pay attention to that. While all that, that was going on, interesting phenomenon. You see it here in Southern California, just over the border in places down by Otay Mesa in TJ, Tijuana, et cetera, but not limited to the border of Mexico with Southern California. But some companies, and this is perfectly legal, so I won't say they're gaming the system or breaking the law, um, but it might change is, is what I will say is that some U.S. companies continue to import in bulk, bringing in 10,000 baseball gloves all at once. But instead of clearing them in the United States and putting them in a D.C. in Topeka, Kansas, they'll move that freight, those containers bonded to Canada or Mexico. We'll, we'll use Tijuana TJ as an example here. And then fulfill direct-to-consumer orders from those bonded warehouses in TJ in this in this instance and qualify as a Section 321 Type 86 entry. That's really smart, and it's legal. How long that's going to be allowed to continue, I don't know, but it's something to think about. All right, moving on. U.S. CBP definitely enforcing rules of origin and regional value content rules related to the U.S. MCA, especially as companies consider ceasing sourcing in places like China or even Southeast Asia and near shore to places like Mexico or Canada. So this, this becomes a big deal. Rules of origin and regional value content, making sure that on a per item per HTS number level that the content of and value of raw materials that go into manufacturing a product is sufficiently high to qualify as a duty-free item under the U.S. Mexico Canada agreement. Naturally, and this is big in fashion as well, CBP will pay much closer attention to the provenance of cotton based products as they should as it relates to forced labor, child labor. I'm, I'm not telling you, given the nature of your business, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but certainly reiterating that point. Here's one, and, and I was looking into this as recently as last night. Forget about China for a minute, forget about the Trump tariffs for a minute. Don't forget the GSP, the Generalized System of Preferences, 
which has been around since the Trade Act of 1974, was enacted in 1975, has yet to be renewed, and given the budget deficit, might not be. Because GSP, which is the preferential duty program given to 119 countries around the world, preferential duties on imports into the United States, has to be renewed periodically by Congress. And we all know how fast they get things done. So GSP has been on the back burner. But historically, when GSP expired, the time that transpired between its expiration and renewal, importers that brought in stuff from India, for example, who just got, well, not just, but was taken off of GSP, by the way, they'd pay the duties all the while. But then when GSP got renewed, you can get your money back. Don't be surprised if that gets taken off the plate as well. GSP has to be renewed, and who's to say that those refunds are going to be available giving our, our financial rates at the U.S. Treasury? So you need to be aware of that. All right. Let's start to wrap up this the trade compliance and trade policy section of the conversation, and we'll move on to technology. Beginning in 2021, there will be a resurgence of U.S. interests in free trade agreements. I just think change of administration, change of philosophy will, will, will certainly bring that forward. In that vein, and, and I've seen some rumblings of this, don't be surprised if the U.S. comes back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership or at least becomes a thing. I've seen a few articles on it. I, I think the administration wants to get through the pandemic and such, but if uh, behind the scenes, don't be surprised if the U.S. might try to get back into that. And the countries that are involved there are on the right. Um, one, one sidebar comment on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and we won't talk about whether who's in favor and, and who isn't, but he, here's an observation that, that I think is salient. If you look at the, the members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, take the U.S. out of it for a second, but Canada, Mexico, I'm on the right-hand side now, Peru, Chile, Australia, the United States already has free trade agreements with those countries. Naturally, the former NAFTA, USMCA, free trade agreement with Chile, Peru, Singapore, and Australia. So I'll, I'll put it this way. If we already have free trade agreements with 80% of the countries that are in the TPP, what's the big deal? You don't have to answer that question. It's a rhetorical question, but think about that for a minute. It also gives us access to Japanese and other Asian markets, uh, the Japanese market being notoriously protectionist. And then finally, as it relates to TPP and reasons why the U.S. might get back into it, the U.S. trade policy has never, ever been solely about trade policy. It's been a proxy for foreign policy. We won't get into the details, but that's why GSP was put into place as a bulwark against communism at the time. It's no coincidence that the Vietnam War, we got out of Vietnam in 1973, and the Trade Act of 1974 went into play in 1974, which enabled GSP, the Generalized System of Preferences. And who were the four biggest beneficiaries of GSP at that time? The same four countries that were under the greatest perceived threat of communist incursions. Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan. And we all know that the issue with GSP is it's a one-way street. Countries that benefit from GSP have access to our markets. We don't have access to theirs. A free trade agreement, two-way street. So for all of these reasons, the history lesson notwithstanding, don't be surprised if TPP becomes a thing. Okay, let's start to wind down a little bit. Trade technology landscape. We know this. COVID-19 exposed the gaps, the blind spots, the disconnects, all of the buzzwords you, you care to throw at it that are inherent to most any international supply chain. You look at an import supply chain, you're talking about a dozen players, mostly arm's length, profit-motivated operators. Of course, there's going to be disconnects and blind spots, et cetera. Technology, to a certain extent, is going to help with that. So whereas importers and exporters, second bullet, acknowledged that they needed visibility and execution tools in 2020, when, 20, when the pandemic came around a little, a little over a year ago, Companies, their budgets were already done. They were already being executed upon. So if they didn't have money set aside for supply chain technology, it's unlikely that they'd be able, especially if their business was down, to invest in technology. Well, 
with the benefit of a year and, and hopefully some, some additional some funding, that those investments in supply chain te technology work their way into 2021 budgets. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Depends on the company, but it makes makes sense to present it that way. But for certain solutions, will focus on descriptive, prescriptive, and predictive capabilities. Welcome to three new buzzwords in the supply chain lexicon as it relates to technology. Descriptive, prescriptive, and predictive capabilities related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Very quickly, if you've not heard these terms before. Descriptive analytics, that's real-time access to information that describes descriptive, that describes an issue to you. A container coming in from Asia is outside of its lead time tolerance. That's, that's descriptive analytics. Notifies people what to do. Good example of the third wave technology, actually. Prescriptive analytics, a little bit more advanced, in that it not only tells you something's wrong, but it gives you a prescription. That's where the word comes from, prescriptive, what to do about it. You know, if you're, you have 10 containers, you have containers coming out of Malaysia, and 10 sailings in a row, you got rolled at the transshipment port of Singapore. You're going to know it anyway, I hope, if you're, if you're on the ball. But prescriptive analytics will point that out and, and not only tell you about it, but make suggestions about other sailings that you might use. A prescription. A pure. And then predictive capabilities, predicting the future. That, that's the real, I, I, it's not the future, it's the now of supply chain technology, and lots of advances have been made there. So within that framework, we're coming down to our time here, but BCOs, that's you, the, the beneficial cargo owners, you're going to be looking for integrated solutions. This is just one example, but transportation management and import compliance. Managing inbound containers, managing inbound air freight, in a TMS environment, but also being able to transition based on product master data information into an import environment. And I'm talking classification, evaluation, PGAs, partner government agency requirements, things like that. 2021, we'll see continued proliferation of startups and VC money, big time money being, being invested in supply chain technology before the pandemic and certainly during and after. One thing people lose sight of when, when you talk about VC money and startups and, and all of this business is that the 3PL community, the freight forwarders and customs brokers, they've been investing in technology, albeit in a pretty slow fashion, for years. And I'm talking again about purchase order management, visibility, terminal visibility, all of those things. So it's not just the startups that are out there that are, that are digitizing supply chain. The 3PL community has and will continue to respond in kind. They're not sitting around with their on their hands. They're coming up with some pretty good solutions. That's good news for beneficial cargo owners because we see in our last slide, you're going to be the beneficiary of that because there's lots of competition out there for which we as third wave have great respect, but we'll also compete with anybody. You're going to be the beneficiary. It is part of your responsibility from a strategic perspective, and I'm talking BCO, and 3PLs for that matter, to have a good, clear understanding of what's going on in the technology landscape. Because international trade is so vast and there are so many players and there's only so much expertise that individual software providers can bring to the table, you're going to see more and more partnerships amongst technology providers to bring together a fully integrated solution. But the big winners, and I'm talking about the software providers themselves, the GTM community, the global trade management software community, the big winners. And this isn't logistics stuff now. Now we're talking supply chain, which is a different ball game. The big winners are going to be those firms that have a great solution, have an actual software solution that brings benefit and solves problems, but that can also feed into upstream supply chain activities that you all, I'm sure, are engaged in as BCOs, especially in fashion, and the need to be introducing new styles and new products all the time. But the big data that can be fed into demand management, meaning forecasting tools, materials planning, and sales and operations planning solutions, huge. And that's where the added benefit comes in. So if I were to make a recommendation, looking for software, not only look for solutions, but what do you do with the big data that is generated by this solution as a natural consequence of what that solution does? And use it for, for forecasting, use it for sales and operations planning. You'll get a way bigger bang for your buck. Keep an eye on the 
Internet of Things, as well as robotic process automation tools, those, those not robots in a warehouse, software bots that replicate data going from one document to another, from a customs entry to a delivery order, for example. And as always, standards are a must. So this is the extra slide. We're almost finished here. In fact, it's, we should be doing okay question-wise. But I added this uh, just last night, you know, and, and thinking it was St. Patrick's Day, and I am of mostly Irish descent, I think, and from Boston, Massachusetts, I can assure you, 30 years ago on St. Patrick's Day night, I wouldn't have been thinking about what's going on for trends and topics in, in logistics and supply chain, but my, my how, how things changed. But uh, last night, um, I was here in my, in my home office thinking about these things, and I think they're relevant. I think they're salient. I brought this up earlier. Gets back to disposable income and just how much can, can we spend, whether it's on fashion items or sporting goods or home gyms or new barbecues or wh whatever your jam is, when will the U.S. experience retail eat, i.e., I can only buy so much stuff. Or I don't have any more money to buy more stuff because I spent all my vacation money on that new that new grill. I just have to wonder about that from a purely quantitative monetary perspective. Here's one. Everyone's talking ocean rates. What about bunker and IMO low sulfur resurgence? It was a, up until a year ago, and this was right before the Trans-Pacific Maritime Conference, many of you who probably attend. But all the, all the talk was IMO low sulfur and what's it going to cost and da-da-da-da. All of a sudden, that wasn't important anymore. It's still important, but it got ignored. Let's put it that way. But if you've been to the gas pumps lately, you know gas, uh, oil, petroleum, and refined gas, bunker, all fuel costs are going up. So be, be ready for that if you're not already as it gets to negotiation with the carriers and the NPOs. On the technology side... If you don't necessarily understand, and I'm not a technologist, so I, if I can understand this, I, I can assure you anyone can. But when you're thinking about supply chain visibility tools, supply chain management, digitized supply chain tools, web-based, web-native tools, this isn't a prediction. This is right now. The continued deployment of APIs, application programming interface, interfaces across supply chain solutions is what's going to drive digitization. This goes back to that point that software providers seek out partnerships to bring together an integrated and transparent solution to BCOs. The, the, we live in an API world. You're still going to see electronic data interchange, EDI and such, but it's all about the APIs. And if you, and just a recommendation, objective recommendation, if you're looking at digitizing, using third parties to digitize your supply chain, ask them about their partnerships, ask them about the APIs that they take advantage of or the apps that they've developed taking advantage of APIs. Good question to ask. Blockchain. This was a thing three, four years ago. It was all the rage at TPM. I think it was three, three years ago, and it kind of went the kind of went quiet. It's coming back. Big investments in blockchain specific to, to logistics, uh, TradeLens, which, which is the Maersk-IBM collaboration on blockchain, a company called Wave, which I, I have third Wave is not affiliated with, or, nor am I, just announced a big investment from Zimline, public information. Pay attention to blockchain. Even if you don't understand it, pay attention to blockchain and, and start to understand it. Also, and we're almost finished, pay attention this, this is a nonprofit organization. It's dcsa.org. Pay attention to what the Digital Container Shipping Association is doing. They're looking to develop standards across the maritime supply chain where bills of lading are all the same, delivery orders are all the same, advanced ship notices are all the same. Standards are really, and I'm talking about technology standards now, are really, really important. I have no affiliation with the DCSA. I just think they're doing some good work. You should pay attention to that. And then finally, I'd just soon end on a positive note, but this isn't. Cyber attacks and logistics and supply chain will, will increase. We won't mention names. We won't call people out. But big-time steam lines, big-time NVOs, big-time freight forwarders, domestic transportation companies in the last two years have been hit pretty hard. Whether you're a BCO, a 3PL, a carrier, risk management as it relates 
to cyber attacks, super important. So another thing you as a BCO need to be thinking about as you digitize, as you continue to work with third parties out in the physical world, a freight forwarder, as you evaluate those organizations, you really have to say, hey, what, what's going on from a risk management perspective in your organization to minimize the probability of cyber attack? All right, that's it. We have seven minutes for questions. I'll gladly stay on, Shannon, but I'll say thank you very much. Hope to see you on another webinar. And as third wave, here's one I, I think you'll like, an upcoming white paper we have, what's wrong with ocean contracts and what can be done about it? Uh, we have a couple things to say about the ocean negotiation process, and we'll, we'll be publishing that in a week or so, timely with the ocean contract negotiating season. But here's my email. Here's my phone number. If you'd like to debate any of these issues, talk about the stuff that we talked about today, happy to do so. If you'd like to talk about third wave, most definitely happy to do so. So Shannon, if you want to run through some questions, we'll, um, we'll hit it. Thanks so much, Dan, for your presentation. Um, as you mentioned, we are opening up the floor to our audience for questions. We'll start with those submitted during the live broadcast, but we definitely encourage our audience members to continue submitting questions. So our first question is, Dan, what do you think will happen to first sale given the recent CIT decision on non-market economies? <laughs> Could you throw me a softball? <laughs> first, first sale has been back and forth forever for years, and it comes down to valuation of imported merchandise, actually. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and, I'm, and I am familiar with the subject. My, my answer to the question is, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's been bantered back and forth so often. Nothing has really definitive has been done over the years. So I, I wish I had a better answer. You know, ask me my favorite color, Shannon. Just start out with something easy. <laughs> but that's a super complicated. It's a very serious subject. Um, but I'll be honest with you, uh, and it's not often that I say I don't know. I, I really don't know. Thank you. And, yeah, we don't get a lot of softballs with uh, this audience. <laughs> and, and better yet, Shannon, if people who want to chime in with, with their thoughts on the matter, we, we can augment the, the quality of that non-answer with other people's input. And certainly happy to entertain that. Yeah, we, we definitely welcome you to chat in. We'll be able to see that if anyone would like to um, help the answer. Um, our next question, do you think that type 86 entries will someday be allowed to be done out of a foreign trade zone? Another easy one, um, for which, gladly, I have an answer. So this, this actually, I had this conversation with somebody, I want to say, goodness, six, six months ago. The Foreign Trade Zone Association is, is asking this question because, of course, Type 86, to qualify as a Section 321 shipment, has to come from overseas directly to, the, to me at my home, again, if I buy that, if I buy that baseball glove. And that's the rule. It can't be conducted as a Section 321 shipment or a Type 86 entry if that does not happen. So the question becomes, well, what if an importer brings in 10,000 baseball gloves from Taiwan, like a normal entry, but instead of doing a consumption entry and paying duties, you know, mock MPF, et cetera, puts the goods into a foreign trade zone physically in the United States, and then when the seller of the baseball gloves, the sporting goods company, receives an individual order from Dan Gardner, it comes out of the FTC and qualifies as Section 321 Type 86 entry. That would preclude the charging of duties as well. So based on that and the amount of money that the Treasury is losing because of the reason we talked about before, the, the growth and especially the, the, three, the Section 301 tariffs, my answer to that question would be no. I don't think that will happen anytime soon. Great. Thank you. Um, and our next question, do you think that the U.S. will rejoin TPP? Yes, I do. <clears throat> and it's not just from a trade perspective because, again, America's trade policy has never been just about trade. It's been a proxy for foreign policy, which is to say we like to influence other countries' behavior by by dangling a carrot in front of them from a trade perspective. 
DSP being the best example of that. And, and a, forget about what people's opinions are about free trade agreements and, and the pluses and minuses, and there are many of each. TPP, in part, was set up as a bulwark to China and, 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 their, and their ambitions, in this instance, in Southeast Asia. And I think that fact remains. It might not be as visible to the U.S. consumer or even to those of us in the trade community, but, but I think as a bulwark against China and their ambitions, albeit commercial and, and geopolitical, that for that reason, the U.S., after the pandemic blows over, let's hope, knock on wood, that, yeah, I think we will. And especially if the Democrats get in a second time, you, you can bank on it. Great, thank you. Um, and our next question, um, would you be able to go into more detail on explaining transload? Yeah. Transload is an is a import model. And that just means a way of conducting your import, imports that is based on full container, factory load shipments from vendors, but it doesn't have to be in Asia, but Transload was pretty much born in Asia. You can do it in Miami for goods coming out of Central America, for example. But these are full containers coming in, factory loads from individual vendors, that as goods are coming across the water, the, the BCO, the, the importer, has the benefit of, especially with supply chain digitization tools these days, to monitor the progress of that container coming across the water five days out, you can do a customs entry, for example. But all, while all that is happening, the importer can look at online sales of products. They can look at store sales when stores are back full, catalog sales, and take these actual demand signals and match those demand signals for specific items up with the contents of specific containers coming across the water and decide on how to allocate inventory to different locations across the country. It's called a postponement strategy. And in that sense, it's an inventory management tool. So I did transload for a, for a BCO, and we took full advantage of that. So we had stores, we had online, we had catalog, bringing in 3,000 FEU a year. And we'd be watching our sales, watching containers coming across the water, having visibility into those containers at a purchase order and an item level, and telling the transload operator, which was a third-party logistics company, saying a thousand, a thousand items coming in for item one, two, three, four, based on, on our instruction, electronic instructions to that transload operator, I want 300 to go to the DC in Chicago, 300 to go to the DC in Dallas, and 400 to go to the DC in Mechanicsburg, PA. That is what transload is. So transload is stripping containers at a US port, and sending the goods out based on actual demand signals. Very, very powerful and been around a long time, especially in retail and especially in fashion. Great, thank you. And we'll give it another minute or so for um, our audience members to submit any final questions. But Dan, do you have any final recommendations um, for brands and retailers as they look to the year ahead? I do, and, and I think that it has to do with a combination of, of technology and uh, the application of, of human knowledge, human skills, human innovation. Um, and I work for a technology company, so I say this in a most objective fashion. Technology has done a lot for international trade, visibility, control, management, execution, all of those things. To make the best use of technology, you can't be over-reliant on it. You have to combine human knowledge, the skills that, pe that people have about classification, evaluation, about logistics, et cetera, and create a hybrid between human talent and technology to really supercharge your supply chain. And I, and I think that would be moving forward. Uh, international trade is always hard. Uh, it's going to continue to get even more tricky. Uh, the other thing that, that I would recommend people is to work your relationships. Again, a human, a human element. Uh, your, your drainage providers, your customs brokers, your software provider that, that you deal with every day. Um, that, again, that, that human element is really important. And I've operated on one premise my entire career.
career in international trade, and that has been know them before you need them. So you want to have a relationship with the party. You don't want to be calling a customs broker for the first time when you're stuffed in, in, in a general order warehouse. It's better to have a relationship developed over time. So I think when you do those things combined with technology, you're going to get a good bang for your, for your time and treasure.